Good morning, Victory Church JB. It is so exciting to uh, be with you, albeit virtually. Um, I um, want to take this moment to greet you and to say happy Resurrection Day. What an incredible moment in history uh, this is. And uh, I want to invite you as you're watching on your streams to join with me to go on a little journey as I take a few moments to share with you the beauty of resurrection and what that means, that Christ is alive, Christ is risen, and he is risen indeed. I want to say thank you to uh, Pastors Louie and Edna and the team for inviting me to be able to speak to you. We are um, in Redding, California at the moment, um, where we're based before we're getting ready to move to Boston, where my wife, Kat, and I will be planting a church. Uh, if you've not met um, us before, we've come uh, into Victory and into the house um, at this beautiful church. A number of times, Katya and I lead a ministry called Frequency, and uh, we get to join in God uh, and with God to bring a, a message of transformation and revival and reformation. So I'm really excited, particularly about today as I speak to you, because I think there's no better thing to talk about than the resurrection. I'd love it if you turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 20 and verse 11. We're going to read um, and pick up the incredible story of Mary of Magdalene, who is gone to the tomb to see where the body of Jesus is. And in verse 11, we see, it says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, we, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned, said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced this to the disciples. I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. I love the Gospel of John. It's one of my favorite Gospels. It's a Gospel that is all about new beginnings. It's a Gospel that is all about God recreating the world through Jesus. And so we see right at the uh, beginning of the Gospel of John in chapter 1, we see the very same words that we see in Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the word was God. We see the sense that John, this incredible gospel writer, is wanting us to understand that he is painting a picture. He is giving a drama, if you like, in which Jesus is the main character and all of the signs, the story plot, all point to him, but it starts with the sense of a new beginning. Uh, in fact, you'll see through the gospel of John, that there are seven miracles that you see happening in the Gospel of John, ending with the eighth miracle, which is the resurrection of Jesus. Um, each of those seven miracles speak a little bit um, of a picture of what it means to be a new community, to be a part of this resurrection community, as it were. And there are signs, there are pointers to what God is doing in the earth. And they kind of um, mirror or they're an allegory of the seven days of creation. Um, I, I think John is one of those gospels that keep on giving. And as we're living in these incredible moments in history, with COVID-19, I'm sure your newsfeed is inundated with uh, scare tactics and uh, fear um, words and just the bombarding of our senses consistently with the sense of what's going to happen, uncertainty in the world. I've got good news to you, for you today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Christ 
is alive. And because of that, we can expect that he is doing and working and preparing something great out of what looks like incredible tragedy. I, as I'm saying, I, I really love the allegory in the Gospel of John. There are so many moments where you see this beautiful picture of um, what it looks like for us to live in his purposes. We see the first miracle that Jesus does, the miracle of um, turning water into wine. Um, I thoroughly love this one. Um, as somebody once said, the church has been trying to turn it back ever since. But uh, I love this because it speaks of the incredible abundance of God. It speaks of the overflowing nature of God's love and kindness. And uh, we see that there's more than enough. And I, I want to pause here because I want to just say this about the miracle of wine. is that we often quote the scripture as God saves the best wine for last. But actually, the verse says that God saves the best wine for now. And some of you might be sitting watching this thinking, God, I feel like I'm in the worst moment. I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to encourage you that you are in the best moment for God to pour out his grace. You are in the best moment for God to overflow with his goodness. In fact, you'll see this theme of abundance running throughout the Gospel of John. There's always the sense of overflow. But what's even more beautiful and nuanced in this particular text to do with marriage um, and the wedding at um, Cana, the first miracle that we see, is that this wedding happens, uh, this miracle happens at a wedding. It happens at a marriage. And uh, the first thing that we see God create in uh, the Genesis story, in the Genesis encounter, is the concept of marriage, is the concept of two opposite things coming together. So you'll see the sun and the moon, you'll see uh, land and sea, you'll see animals and plants, seemingly opposite things coming together. And of course, you see a man and women, and we know how opposites they are to bring together. Um, All these opposites coming together. And I love that concept of marriage, that God has established that right at the beginning, and yet the first marriage that we see established in Genesis is when God creates the heavens and the earth. In fact, some phrases talks about the heavens for the earth. They're connected. They're meant to be for one another. Um, heaven is for earth and earth is for heaven. And I believe God is restoring. God is helping us understand what it means to genuinely live in deep connection with heaven on earth and with earth having access to the realm of heaven consistently. And we see all these different miracles happening throughout the scriptures in the Gospel of John. And then we get to this number eight miracle where we see resurrection. We see this incredible miracle of Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's alive. I love the moment when Jesus is on the cross and he is about to give his spirit to his father, he says something quite incredible. He says, um, it is finished. It's a beautiful phrase. And that phrase actually is referring to what happened in uh, the Garden of Eden. Because you must remember what was lost in the Garden of Eden is restored in the Garden in the Gospel of John, the Garden where the passion begins, where Jesus chooses, not my will, but your will, where on the hill of Golgotha, um, this incredible moment where he says the work is now completed. And then in the garden too, we see these phrases of God restoring some things. And the thing I, I love about the moment when Jesus says it is finished is he's, he's helping us see something of what happened in the garden of Eden when God had created everything, seven days of intensive work, And then he sits down and he says, it is good. There's a sense in which Jesus is saying on the cross, everything that is needed for creation, the new creation to begin is now completed. It is good. And he rests in death because he knows that his father will bring him back to life again. And then we see this moment, this beautiful moment where Again, what was lost in the garden is restored. 
we see, he, uh, we see um, Mary coming in the garden too, and she is looking for the one that her heart loves. She's looking for Jesus. And uh, we see this moment of beautiful restoration. How many of you remember that it was in the garden that women lost their place, that women lost their sense of worth and their co-assignment with Adam because of sin? In fact, women's testimonies were completely disregarded in this Middle Eastern context in those days. They, they didn't even regard a woman's testimony as valid. Yet what Jesus does is he restores the place of a woman in this garden moment. And he reveals to Mary, I am alive. I'm not dead, I'm alive. And I want you to be the first announcer, the first mouthpiece, the first apostolic delegate, as it were, one who is sent to tell everyone that you've seen me and that I am alive. Women, that is super exciting, and I trust you're jumping out of your couches right now going, yes, because God has restored you to come alongside of the beauty and the splendor of what it means for men and women to work together for kingdom extension. Those are just some of the overtures and allegories that are used in the Gospel of John. But I really want to hone in to the text this morning. Mary is looking for the one that she loves. And she comes to this tomb and she sees two angels. Again, I love this moment because, again, John is wanting us to connect to what was happening in the Garden of Eden. How many of you remember when Adam and Eve were graciously expelled from the Garden of Eden so they would not be left in their sin forever? There were two angels guarding the place of Eden, as it were. And remember, Eden is the first place where heaven and earth meet together in perfection without any disruption. And because of sin, Adam and Eve are moved out of the garden, and these two angels guard the place of Eden. What I love is that the first thing that Mary sees when she comes to this empty tomb are two angels waiting, saying, He's not here. He's not in the tomb. He's no longer being held back. The whole point of resurrection, the whole point of the new creation, the whole point of God's presence was never to be contained in a tomb, never to be contained in the Holy of Holies. It's why we see the curtain torn from the top to the bottom. It was not simply that we could get in. It was so that he could get out and cover the earth with his glory, cover the earth with his goodness. It's, it's an astounding thing. God with us, Emmanuel, all of the prophetic words that were spoken about Emmanuel being with us, finally are now made manifest in the person and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so she sees these two angels and she says, where have you laid him? And she turns around and she sees Jesus, but she thinks He's a gardener. I, I love this point because we see something happening. God's redeeming something in this moment. John wants us to see a beautiful picture because Christ Jesus, our, our second and perfect Adam, the Bible calls him, is revealed not simply as conquering king. He's not simply revealed as Lord over everything. He's not simply revealed as a warrior God that comes in and smashes things down. He's revealed as a gardener, just like Adam in the Garden of Eden was, one who is called to extend the presence of God all over the earth. The first revelation that Mary gets of the resurrected Lord is a humble gardener tilling the ground of the earth, making things new, establishing his purposes on the earth. And I want to suggest to you that part of our call in this season is not simply to go after glamour. It's not simply to go after more likes on our Insta feeds. It's not simply to go after popularity. It is simply to garden the place of influence that you have. It's simply to be like Jesus, as it were, and join him in extending the garden of his presence and his influence beginning in your home and every other sphere that God might have given you. Mary gets a revelation of Jesus 
as a gardener. And then number thing you know, I want to pull out of this um, because Jesus immediately in that context says to Mary, Mary, go and tell your brothers that my father is now their father. Up until this point, the disciples referred to God as Yahweh, as one who was up there as it were disconnected from their own intimacy and their own relating. And Jesus had modeled for them what it's like for us to live in perfect relationship with the Father. And at this moment of resurrection, we see this beautiful picture where Jesus says, it's all being restored. You've got relationship now with your Father. You've got relationship now with the one that you love. My Father is now your Father. And the first thing I want to say that the resurrection does for us The first thing I want to say that this historical event of Jesus rising from the dead and overcoming sin and sickness and and, and everything that could separate us from him is the fact that we, by grace, receive the same beautiful relationship that Jesus has with his own father. We get to enter into relationship with a perfect, kind, good father because of Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. It, it, it always gets me. I'm invited and afforded the same place of intimacy that Jesus has with the Father. The Bible says we are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Do you know that right now the same space of intimacy that Jesus occupies with the Father is the same space of intimacy that you get to occupy with the Father. And he says, my Father is now your Father. He invites us into a co-sharing of sonship with his Father. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to know that what I could never earn by my own strength or effort Jesus is given as a free gift in his life, lived in the death that he died and in the resurrection that he now brings. You are a co-son. You share in the relationship with the Father. It's It's a magnificent thing when you begin to grasp and understand the incredible impossibility that that now affords us. We get to work with our heavenly Papa And he is super kind. He is so good. He is so faithful. And you might be sitting in this moment feeling fearful, feeling like I've got nothing to give, feeling locked in by circumstances and physically because of a virus. I want to encourage you that because Jesus is alive, you've got a good father who's working on your behalf to make sure that even what seems like the worst thing that could be happening will be turned for your good. He loves you so deeply, so passionately, so ferociously and so wonderfully that he's not going to leave you where you are, but he's going to work things out. The beauty of the resurrection means that even in our worst moments, Jesus is still working out circumstances for our good and for his glory. He's a good father. And because of Jesus, you've been invited into that space of being a co-son and sharing in father's love and in the father's reward. The second thing I love about the resurrection is that we become co-workers with him. You see, this revelation of Jesus as gardener is not an incidental one. Many of us feel that heaven is simply the place we're going to go to when we die. I want to say to you that heaven is a coexisting reality that is meant to redeem and make all things new here on earth right now. And somebody once said, this is not um, pie in the sky for the day that we die. No, no, this is steak on the plate while we wait. We get to enter into the reward of resurrection life and new creation breaking out right here, right now. It means that despite the circumstances, God in Christ is at work making all things new. 
He is shifting things. He is moving things. He is restoring things, and he will make all things new. The Bible says that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. It also says in Hebrews that the enemies of Jesus will be made his footstool. We are living in that space right now where Jesus, despite the circumstances, because of the historical fact that he is alive, that he's been resurrected, it means that that resurrection life is breaking out all over the earth. It's why Paul in Romans so beautifully says, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now at work in you, quickening your mortal bodies. If you're watching this and you're sick in your body, if you are in pain, even right now, Holy Spirit wants to come and quicken your mortal body so that you experience the full effect of the new creation breaking out on you. You see, the resurrection was not simply to deal with your past. It was to deal with your future. And somebody once said, the crucifixion deals with our old man, but the resurrection deals with our new empowered life. And Jesus has invited you to co-work with him, to co-partner with him as a son extending the garden of heaven, as it were, all over the earth. Where once before Eden was located in a specific place, now the kingdom of heaven is in you. So that wherever you go, whatever sphere of influence you're in, you get to extend it around you. The third thing that I love about this moment is not only that we are our co sons, not only that we are co workers, but we get to enter in to the reality of this resurrection life breaking out in the most beautiful ways and in the ways that we can least expect it. And here's why. Because we are co-inheritors with Jesus. Not only are we co-sons, not only are we co-workers, but we're co-inheritors. And the thing about being an inheritor with him, the thing about receiving this inheritance, is it's not for the day that we de- die. It's for now. We get to enter into his inheritance right now. And the most beautiful thing about this expression of inheritance, the most beautiful thing about this expression of resurrection life being ours now, is that we are expecting that one day Jesus will return and get the full reward of everything that he paid for on the cross. This is not only a present reality, but a future reality. He is making all things new, and he will make all things new, and everything will come under his reign and under his rulership. And I want to encourage you, sometimes we can be stuck in this place of incredible mystery and tension as to why is God allowing things like this to happen? Why is there so much devastation in the world? I I've been praying for South Africa in particular because this is my home nation, thinking about the impact of what it looks like for the poor and the broken in this season to be locked away. And I cannot make sense of the pain outside of the cross and the resurrection. I cannot make sense of what God is doing outside of the fact that Jesus will come back, justice will be established on the earth, And all things will be made new. And even when I don't see it, he, because he is alive and coming back, is working things out for our good and for his glory. My life, I often tell people, my life is bookended by two realities. Jesus is alive and he is seated at the right hand of God. He's been ascended and all things are being made new and he will come back again. In between those two places, there is a mystery that I don't always understand. But because the cross was a historical fact, because the tomb is empty, because he is alive, sooner or later, he's going to change everything. Sooner or later, we're going to see the fullness of resurrection life work out. Until then, we're seeing it break in here a little, there a little, And I'm so glad to say that we're seeing him break in a whole lot more 
even in my community here in Reagan, we're hearing stories of people already getting healed of this virus. We're hearing stories of families getting reunited and restored because of the lockdown. I want to encourage you. You're a co-son. You're a, you're a co-worker, as it were, and you're a co-heir with the reality of resurrection. God has invited you into this so that you get to enjoy everything that he has for you right now. Can I encourage you, dear friends, even as you're sitting right now in your homes watching this um, this preach, God wants to break in where you're at. And I want to say to you, in the season of lockdown, God wants to unlock some things. As I've been praying over this last season about what is God saying and being um, a prophetic voice into many different nations and saying, God, what are you saying? What's going on? I felt the Lord remind me of Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah, in the season that King Uzziah dies, in the season of economic turmoil, in the season of pain, in the season of instability, Isaiah gets a vision of the Lord, and it's out of that context that God releases a commission for him to do what he's called. And I want to say to you, in the season of lockdown, God wants to unlock encounter for you. And it doesn't need to look like stop playing music in the background. It doesn't need to look like a big Sunday morning meeting. Those are important and they will resume because God loves it when communities gather. But what is important is that God's connecting you to him and to his resurrection life again so that you begin to see the impact of newness breaking out wherever you go. So this Easter Sunday, this resurrection day, I want to charge you and I want to commission you that in your lockdown, get a fresh perspective of who he is. Like Isaiah did, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. He's in charge. He's working this out. Because Jesus is alive, we will see his justice, his goodness, and his peace be established across the earth so that we can have confidence in this moment of Passover, that there is life and resurrection to be experienced. There is new creation to enjoy. So my prayer for you, Victory Church, in the season of mystery, in the season of instability, in the season of difficulty, in the season of economic hardship, that you will keep your eye fixed on the cross and see that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that new creation life is at work in you right now. God bless you and thank you for watching.